Welcome to Hardware Asylum. In this video, we'll be working again on our retro PC subwoofer project. If you're unfamiliar, this is a project designed to add more boom to your beige box. In the previous video, I showed you the construction of this particular enclosure, which is comprised of two Tang Band 5 inch subwoofers in an isobaric configuration. One thing I didn't mention in the previous video is that when I designed this particular enclosure, I did so with the idea of a single driver in mind. The size of the box, the type of port, the tuning frequency was all modeled to have a very flat response curve and be able to hit some relatively deep notes. Adding an isobaric loading to this particular enclosure was mostly for show and just to see if I could do it. If you look at the response curves, there wasn't a hump at the low frequency like what we would expect with an isobaric configuration. And I noted that there might be something wrong with the box, either the coupling between the drivers or the size of the enclosure. Now one of the benefits of isobaric loading is that it changes the dynamics of the speaker in relation to the enclosure that the speakers are in. Now what that really means is that when we have two speakers working together, it sees the container as being twice as big. And in the case of this particular enclosure, twice as big means it's pretty much in a free air resonance. Now if we look at it a different way, that also means that we can remove half of the box and get the same base. There are a few fundamental changes that need to be noted by removing half of the airspace of any given enclosure. The first is the style and size of the port. In the previous box we had a 2 inch port that was around 9 inches long. In this particular enclosure we can't use a 2 inch port anymore because the length of it would be too long it wouldn't fit inside this box at all. So if we reduce it down to a one inch port, something like this, it can be a lot shorter. However, the port velocity is too high and we'll get what they call chuffing, or, be able to, or basically we're gonna be able to hear the air coming out the port. It's no longer bass, it's mostly distortion. To compensate for that, we lengthen the port. This is about nine and a half inches long, and then add a second one. Now the location of the port is also going to change. In the previous box design we had the port down here in the front, but with the length of the port and the size of the box we're going to have to move it to the top just to make sure that we have enough space. Now that the single woofer test has been completed, we're going to go ahead and put the second driver in there and test it the way that it's intended to be used. Well, we have some interesting results that are worth talking about. So I'm going to go into presentation mode here. The first one that we're going to talk about is the modeling. So I modeled this subwoofer in WinISD. And what I would like to call your attention to is the curve. We have a 3 dB down point of 35 Hertz. I did tune this box to be 33 Hertz. Now, if we go and change from a single driver configuration to the ISO bank, 
We can see what effect adding a second driver does, at least in the modeling software. Our 3dB down point is now at 28 hertz and a nice amplification around 40 hertz. This is also something that we should see in the final measurements of our subwoofer. And if we get to the single driver versus ISO dual driver, you'll see that uh, eh, not so much. We have a very lazy response curve. The shaded area at the bottom of the chart is our 80 dB measurement point. So when I test this subwoofer, it was at 80 dB. So ideally anything below that would not be heard and anything above that would be our usable frequencies. The line in purple is our single driver test and the line in green is the isobaric test. I've highlighted a couple of points along the curve in the orange arrow. So we have a couple of spikes at around 35 and 50 hertz. And we have a huge drop off in frequency, whereas with the single driver, it carries on past 200 hertz. Much to my disappointment, the isobaric loading did really absolutely nothing for this particular box. It didn't increase the frequency. It didn't match the modeling. And I started to dive in to find out why. My first experiment was to see if the port loading or port location would have any impact on the resulting frequency response. The orange line is with the measurement mic pointed directly at the ports, whereas with the green line, that is in the standard configuration in front of the driver. What we can see here is that if we combine the two together, we get a curve that is relatively flat, although it does make a couple of switches. The ports will hit the lower frequencies, but it will die off in the upper frequencies, whereas at the speaker, it is very low at the lower frequencies and then has an amplification at the higher frequencies. And what this tells me is that while a lot of people will claim that the port location doesn't matter, these response curves say otherwise. Now to provide a little context into why I am upset with this particular configuration, we're going to overlay the larger box over the smaller box. The red line is the larger box and that was in the previous video. I'll put a link in the show notes below. The green line is the new response curve for this particular configuration. And I've highlighted a couple of areas along the response curve. With the larger box, we have a nice flat response that starts at around 33 hertz and carries all the way to around 100 hertz when it starts to fall off. Whereas with the smaller box, we have a complete absence of frequency up until around the 45 hertz mark, where then it goes and amplifies. Overall, this tells me that with this particular configuration, it might work well for a desktop or bookshelf style speaker where we have mid-range and high-end in the same container. But for a subwoofer, which is what I am after, it kind of falls on its face. The final chart that I want to call out is one where I tested the tuning frequency of the port to determine if maybe it was too short or too long and that was contributing to why the box was not responding the way that it should. And to do this, we basically put the measurement microphone directly at the end of one of the ports. We run our subwoofer test and we map out what the response is. The end result is that we have a peak at 36 hertz, which is slightly higher than the tuning frequency of 33, but it's in the ballpark and it really tells me that the port tuning was right on. The other line on the chart is the speaker tuning or the box tuning, and it matches what our frequency response curves were from the previous slides. So the real question is why didn't the box respond the way that the modeling software reported? And I have a couple of theories. The first one is that, well, subwoofers are not designed the way that they were back, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago when large boxes were required to get extremely low frequencies. Newer speaker designs have enhanced the TS or the speaker parameters in such a way that isobaric loading is no longer required to get a much smaller box design. And it would seem that with the much smaller boxes, the impact that isobaric loading has on a driver has less of an impact, making it a bit wasteful to go and combine two drivers in this particular configuration. However, this experiment was extremely eye-opening and we can use what we've learned from these two different box designs when we are building the next project. As always, thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing, and I'll see you in the next one.